Hello and welcome to the MIT Open Documentary Lab talk. I'm Sarah Wallace and I'm the director of the lab. And today I'm pleased to introduce Jarrett Vedera, who's a transdisciplinary artist whose work examines how images colonize the ways that we see the worlds around and within us. Vedera hacks different visual systems and reconfigures them to open up parallel ways of seeing. His work is influenced by decolonial, decolonial theory, science fiction, and the study of impossible objects. In parallel, Vedera has worked as a curator, organizer, and writer on projects that focus on art as a catalyst for cultural change. His paintings, prints, photographs, videos, and installations have been exhibited and screened internationally at venues such as the Queens Museum, MoMA, the Smithsonian Asian Pacific Art Center, Asia Society, Aga Khan Museum, Baudali Lad Museum, and the Marava Art Center. He's currently assistant professor of practice in new media in the architecture art and planning school at Cornell University and an affiliate professor in studio arts at Concordia University. Jarrett lives and works between Canada, the US and India and is currently based in Brooklyn. Before I hand it over to him, I just wanna remind people that we will have a Q&A at the end and please put your questions in the Q&A section. Without further ado, Jarrett. Thank you so much, Sarah. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna open up uh, my share screen here, and let's see if we can get um, things started. Let's see, can you see the, the the title card? Yes. Okay, great. So thank you so much, Sarah. Um, I really appreciate the invitation to talk to the. Um, to, to the group of students and um, researchers and thinkers um, that you have in your lab. Um, and I'm, I'm really happy to be talking about this, um, partially because, um, you know, uh, talking about algorithms and technology as they intersect within art is, is sometimes uh, a conversation that uh, people, you know, quickly uh, Sort of tune out of, and I think that the work that you've been doing um, in, in your lab really embraces and, and pushes the conversation forward in all these really um, interesting ways. Um, so I wanted to thank you, and I also wanted to thank Claudia. Um, I also wanted to thank Reka and Sarita um, for uh, their help um, in um, helping me kind of figure out um, how to structure uh, the talk today. So in this presentation, I'm going to start off uh, with a little context first. Uh, and then I'll discuss a number of works in my object-oriented practice. Uh, but because of time, I won't be screening any of my video work, uh, and, but I will discuss uh, uh, three of them through a few uh, video stills that I've, I've compiled closer to the end of the presentation. And then at the very end, I'll uh, talk a little bit more about my parallel lives as a curator, writer, educator, um, and cultural producer in general. So they say it's good to begin at the beginning, um, and this is where I began. I began uh, in Toronto in the 70s, uh, just a few years after my parents um, moved to Canada. They were part of a huge wave of migrants coming from all over the global south. Um, and this is Flemington Park. Flemington Park uh, has been called an arrival city uh, on its good days. Uh, an arrival city is a, a kind of springboard community that um, urban planners have theorized as a, you know, a, a springboard community for new immigrants that are coming from other countries or coming from rural environments into the city. And it's kind of like a jump off or a platform. So on its good days, it's called an arrival city. And on its bad days, it's been um, called an immigrant ghetto. Um, my parents were both working class blue collar immigrants. They both spoke three or more languages. My mother is Catholic from the Philippines, and my father was a unique mix of atheist and Hindu, um, and he came from India. Uh, so growing up in my family uh, at that time, you know, with this huge influx of uh, migrants in, in Toronto, uh, surrounded by people from all over the world, uh, this is where I first became really acutely aware of how languages cultures and belief systems, you know, kind of shape and control the way that we perceive the world around and within us. Translations and mistranslations were always being negotiated in a very non-academic way. They were 
um, you know, just always in the air in a very real and everyday way. Um, and I think this is, you know, I bring this up because I think it's this time in my life that really sparked my interest in how meanings um, get generated through different processes, which is an ongoing theme as we'll see through um, the rest uh, of the presentation. Growing up as a person of mixed descent, educated in North American schools, I also felt another, um, uh, another thing very acutely, which was the conspicuous absence of uh, brown and black voices uh, in uh, our histories being represented uh, in, you know, in teachers, in, in books, in examples of uh, artists and other people that I could look up to. Um, and this was amplified uh, throughout all of my education, but really kind of came to a head when I was in graduate school um, at Yale. At Yale, I was uh, expected to, to really perform this exotic caricature of myself um, as an artist. And, or I was asked to act as a cultural informant, or I was asked to assume this very you know, universal, neutral subject position, and um, it felt really uh, assimilating. So, you know, in the process of, of, of you know, working out what it is that I, I was making as, as a student, I began to ask myself the question of, if I'm a cultural producer, what culture am I producing from? What culture am I producing for? And so I found myself um, in the library, as I often do, when I'm looking for, um, for answers or maybe other questions. But Yale's art library was, uh, was no good either. I couldn't find any books on contemporary Filipino or Indian art. Um, but they did have um, a lot of books with uh, pictures like this. Um, and this picture was taken during the British colonial era. It's a photograph from the 1900s of the English King Emperor. That's a crazy name, the English King Emperor and the Prime Minister of Nepal, um, doing what I guess great powerful people did back then, or so it seemed in these books, they went um, on a tiger hunt. And this image kind of grabbed me and it wouldn't let me go. Um, and I made a number of works to kind of make my way through uh, what it was that was um, kind of haunting me in this image. At the time, I was deeply entrenched in post-colonial theory, which seemed like an antidote to me to the, uh, the very hegemonic um, Amero-Eurocentric art education that I was getting. You know, I was a working class brown kid at this Ivy League American school. And I remember feeling like I was um, being colonized. So I felt like I was you know, this one character, like that I was identifying as the colonized, but I also felt like the coloner, colonizer, I was getting this, you know, this education that was um, a kind of top-down education, um, but really I was strangely feeling um, the most like uh, the dead tiger. And so I reimagined this photograph um, and I, I stood in as all three characters. And you know, I, I normally start off with this image uh, because it, it kind of shows the way that um, I've dealt with some of the, the absences or thought through um, you know, ways of reimagining um, images in, uh, in the archive or thinking about like new uh, sci-fi kind of um, imaginings. So this became like a strategy that I, I then began to develop. I kind of leaned into this multi-positionality and I began thinking um, in threes. Um, I started experimenting with different constellations of, of works as a strategy. And I, I thought about like, how can I juxtapose different works in different mediums that operate cognitively at different speeds. Perhaps, perhaps I could form a kind of slow, non-narrative, multivalent storytelling um, as a way to conjure a kind of cognitive ghost image or to present something that is absent, unrepresented, or unrepresentable. This constellation was part of an exhibition titled Else, which included uh, the the, uh, the photograph um, that's on the left here that I then printed off to look like it was a page ripped out of a book. Um, and the title was Untitled Three. Uh, beside that, the middle is a gold flocked X. I was really interested in X in mathematics or X um, uh, on, you know, like in a treasure map as this kind of a, a thing that catalyzes people towards, uh, towards seeking and exploring. Um, and then uh, to the right of that is uh, an ambiguous kind of hybrid 
X-ray um, slash map um, from another series of work called Here Be Dragons. This is another constellation um, that was part of an exhibition uh, titled Pro Prolonged Engagement. Um, on the very left here, there was a, a short looping video titled Black Box about virtual perception um, as a kind of super body. And this image is titled, I Promise I'll Believe. And it's from a series of screen captures that I took of glitches in Skype conversations. And this work, um, the third work in, in, the, in the constellation will take a little bit more explaining uh, because the process is a little bit uh, more layered. So uh, this one is called um, Self-Portrait in Seven Pantone Colors. And what I did for this, uh, for this image is I took multiple photographs, um, 360 degrees around my body, um, and then I aggregated the photographs uh, from like the top down. And so they formed these banded uh, layers that were averaged horizontally uh, from top to bottom. And I, I filtered them using only Pantone colors. Uh, so, so basically the, the very top of there, it's like the most black it's because if you go 360 degrees around the top of my head, um, it's mostly black. If you, if you go through this part of my face, you'll have um, another kind of average color mixed with the black of my hair and that will kind of meet in the middle and so on and so forth through the body. Uh, the other thing that is of, of note with this piece is that it's, um, it's scale, it's my height, it's five feet. Um, 10 inches, which is approximately, approximately my height, and it's about three and a half feet wide, which is the calculated surface area of the outside of my body. I found this, um, this equation, as I often do in my weird quixotic research, that could, um, you know, based on your weight um, and your height, you could kind of figure out sort of the uh, surface area of, of your skin. Um, and so, Self-portrait look is in seven Pantone colors is looking at the skin of my body as a kind of image um, and the ways that brown bodies have been um, translated in post 9-11 America in post 9-11 America have been um, have often been malignant one-sided or uh, essentializing and reductivist so that kind of signification of the brown body then gets uh, put onto my body which then actually kind of just functions as an image. And, and prevents me from navigating the world in, um, in easy ways sometimes. The next few images are from another series of work um, that were influenced by infographics, fMRIs, Rorschach tests, and maps. The series looks at the internet as a kind of uh, neuronal network where the search engine algorithms become, become a kind of memory that shapes our perception of what we see and what we don't. This work is called All We See is Vision. Um, and this is a digital rendering that then becomes a large vinyl cut that goes directly onto a, a gallery wall. And what I do is I do an, an individual image search for each word in the phrase, all we see is and vision. And then I download one of the first images that come up. I drop the color, vectorize it, and then combine it with others to create a new aggregate form. And then I, um, I do some detective work and figure out where in the world the server was located that the image was originally downloaded from. So using um, reverse IP lookups and um, doing some kind of stealth work, uh, I figured you know, um, generally where, uh, what city and what the longitude and latitude um, of the servers are um, on a physical map of the world. And then I integrate all that information back into the image, and the information corresponds um, with this, you know, with, with an invisible map um, of the world. So it implies where things are from. So British Columbia, Utah, Virginia, Massachusetts are where um, you know uh, most of these images images came from, um, and I ended up just uh, putting those into the to the image. This is a picture of the work. 
in um, another constellation for a show at William Patterson Museum called Double Bind. This one is titled, Even Nowhere is Someplace. And it was installed in an exhibition titled Accented in the UAE. And it stands at about 16 uh, by nine feet. This one is titled, um, Ascending to Outer Space to Find Another Race. And this one is about 12 by, um, by five feet. And it's installed in an exhibition titled, uh, The Closer I Get, The Further I Find. And next to that is uh, another work called Chronomad. The Chronomad is a performative photograph, um, similar in some ways uh, to the, the first image that I opened with, which kind of looks at anthropological images or colonial images, and then thinks through um, new relationships uh, that overlap with science fiction. Um, it's from a speculative fiction series about Asian futurism and imaginaries. Uh, a chronomad is defined as a person who travels across time. Um, and another way to look at it is um, they can migrate across different dimensions. And the key to the chronomad is that they, they operate in a, in a very nonlinear way. So there's ways that I was thinking about this you know, fictitious character of a, a chronomad as um, another way to think about somebody who moves across time zones, somebody who moves in and out of different cultural spaces, different ways of seeing um, and, uh, and thinking about them in, in, a, in a positive sort of uh, supernatural kind of way. This work is titled Dollar Store Dragon, uh, which is a bit of a homage to, um, to Flemington Park and some of the communities that I grew up in. Uh, in this work, I, I took an old worn out pair of shoes and reimagined it using uh, duct tape and paint. And it's from a series uh, of, of works called All That Glitters. And All That Glitters is influenced by um, dollar store aesthetics, uh, Filipino gypneys, and the art of golden repair. And in the series, I'm really interested in these small makeshift gestures when the discarded, the cheap, or the broke down is reimagined, tricked out, and becomes something altogether new. This is an installation shot from one of the constellations uh, where the, the shoes were, um, were installed and the exhibition was called Aliens, Dead Zones and Beyonders. This is a projection that was in the exhibition and it's a digital image capture of a street, uh, street view map um, looking out at the ocean and it's titled Where the Ocean Meets the Sky. This and the next few works uh, are from a, a speculative series of works titled the Pangea series, where I examine some of the relationships between representation, power, territory, and migration. Pangea is a thought experiment, um, a, spe a speculative proposition of a borderless land populated by mythical emperors, chronomads, sleepwalkers, and avatars made of water. This is called No Country. In no country, I used um, one of the most uh, popular and widespread maps um, or mapping projections called the Mercator projection, um, which is what I learned uh, was the world when I was uh, a kid growing up. And the Mercator pr projection, for those of you who, um, who, who know, know that it's, a, uh, um, it's widely considered a, a racist map that privileges the, uh, the global north as opposed to the global south and um, really creates uh, uh, an inflated uh, sort of scale to um, North America and, and to Europe and really diminishes the size of the continent of, of Africa. Um, and it was used uh, quite widely because of its, um, its efficiency in, in figuring out navigation um, for colonial ships. Um, and I think Google still uses it right now because it's, it kind of works on a grid that 
uh, allows you to zoom um, in and out more easily. Uh, there may be some changes to Google right now, but this is uh, one of the projections. So this is you know, a very common image that uh, defines how we understand the, the power relationships, the scale of land in the world. And it's um, for the most part, um, or it is in, in many ways incorrect. So in this, uh, in, in this work, no country, I uh, redacted every name of every territory on the map. Um, I kind of went methodically over one by one and it was a performative gesture. And I was kind of meditating on, you know, um, borders and the names, like every single name of every single place is written um, in a, a history of, of power. A lot of the borders, uh, most of the borders are written in um, blood. And so, uh, you know, Pangea becomes almost uh, this, this kind of proposition um, for, something, for something else. This work uh, is called The Emperor of No Country. This is called A Flag for No Country. Um, and it also is the same scale of the surface area of my, my body, my skin. So it's about uh, almost six feet by, uh, by three and a half feet. And what I did for this, uh, for this piece was I aggregated all of the uh, flags from around the world, like all of the nation states um, and the number of nations that I feel should have sovereignty. Um, and I kind of averaged uh, the color based on um, the amount that they, they kind of show up. Uh, and I, I just wanted to kind of see what color it would create if, if we kind of broke it down into one color. So this is the single color that comes from um, mixing all of the flag colors together. And it's interesting when you look at, you know, the history of uh, flag colors, they, they often relate to um, a number of, of different affinities, uh, you know, either uh, religion or a colonizer or, um, or different things. But the, the main colors that show up in the flags like the highest percentages were red and white. Um, and then blue was like a, like a third that, you know, it's kind of like a trailing third. Uh, but the red and white kind of came together to form like a base that was kind of pinkish. And then the end uh, was really surprising to me. It turned into this like taupey band-aid color. Um, and then so I printed it off um, on a flag and then I hung it. And, uh, this is um, another self-portrait. Uh, and this one is called Self-Portrait in Ocean Blue. Uh, so the, in the Pangea series, I was also thinking about decoupling the colonial relationships between the, the body and land and territory. And I started thinking more about the body and identity in relation to fluidity and in relationship to water. Um, so it was done in a, kind of the same way that the earlier ones, seven um, self-portrait in seven Pantone colors, taking photographs around my body. Uh, but then instead of using Pantone colors in this one, what I did was I created uh, a, a tritone color profile that was based off of the colors of bodies of water near um, different places, four different places that I consider um, to relate to, to home for me. So um, Toronto, New York, uh, Bombay, and Manila. And so based on those profiles, I created um, this kind of like blue tritone color that then became the filter that I, um, um, I used in this work. So now I'll briefly talk about a few video projects. Um, I think they might, uh, I didn't want to, to not include the video projects, but I felt like uh, it might ruin the flow of the presentation. Uh, we have about 40 minutes to go through things. But what I did do was I, I have some of the links to the, the next three projects I'll be talking about. And um, I'm not sure if Claudia uh, uploaded them into the chat or she could do them um, whenever. Um, but there's also links that I encourage you to watch um, and to experience the work um, on its own time. So I'll be talking about three works. One is called File Not Found, which is this one. Um, another one is called uh, On Kings and Elephants. And the last one is Ident Unidentified.
So file not found is a short video of text in single images where an unnamed identity contemplates their own death and the fragility of memory in relation to the search engine. I first wrote out uh, this text and then used uh, the image search uh, in a similar way to the, the way that I was using um, the image search in uh, the Rorschach uh, graphics, infographics. Um, and then, you know, based on the images that came up from each search, they also became um, the images that um, showed up in the video as they corresponded and sometimes didn't quite correspond with the, uh, the words being used. In the second video um, that I wanted to talk about, it's called On Kings and Elephants. And On Kings and Elephants, uh, it, it was, it was it's it's an old story. I mean, basically, it's based on um, the story of uh, the elephant in the dark, um, or the poor blind man and the elephant. Um, and I was use I use this story kind of as a base um, to explore the ways that um, accented text to speech software programs um, work and how how they translate and you know how it would be if I fed this this ancient story into this new technology. And what would happen when um, a text-to-speech software program would um, would retell it? So over the centuries, this story has traveled across many cultures, and it's been translated innumerable times in different eras. And the main crux of the story was that it warns uh, about the trappings of translation, ego, and certainty. The narrator reads through three English translations of the story from the night from the 12th century, the 13th century, and the 19th century, um, you know, by Ramakrishna, by Rumi, and by um, the poet Sinai. Um, and although there are subtitles in the work, it has no images, and it kind of becomes more of um, a sound piece that it, it has like these really interesting uh, hiccups uh, that I find uh, quite glitchy uh, on a cognitive level. The last um, of the video stills that I wanted to, to show are from the video Unidentified. Um, and in I Unidentified, uh, I did a, a number of searches for the images, for images of um, aliens or UFO sightings um, that I could find on the internet. And what I was doing in this video was I was really drawing on the aesthetic of a slideshow. And uh, I created this kind of floating text uh, and the floating text you know, ends up structuring the work. And then the, uh, the images also correspond in that way where they're both like aligned but kind of off. Um, and the, the text itself was looking at um, some of the intersections between the political rhetoric surrounding the idea of aliens and, uh, and kind of an analysis uh, of the idea of the union shadow and our um, fear of the other. Um, it also looked at um, conversations about UFOs. You know, there's so many really fascinating um, websites that I came across, like uh, looking into you know UFOs and, and sort of the the, the, the vast amount of um, information that they have to support some of these claims is really fascinating. They really blur this line uh, between fact and fiction, fake news, uh, deep fakes, all of that. Um, but also, I really wanted to, to highlight this you know, conversation that uh, was kind of ever present uh, that dealt, was dealing with migrants. Um, you know, over the last four years or so, um, and and before that, but also really like thinking through deeply some of the multifarious uh, ways that we can think about the idea of the alien. So this will be the last section of the presentation. I just wanted to talk um, a bit about some of the other things that I, I do besides making um, besides making objects. Uh, sometimes I make things and um, sometimes I make things happen. 
And I've also worked as a curator, programmer, and writer. And often it's really on projects or exhibitions that amplify underrepresented artists um, from North America and um, often from the global South. And you know, there's all these different ways that I've worked with uh, nonprofits for the last 20 years. Um, I'm very open and actually seek out to do collaborative projects or to participate in, in other people's projects. Uh, and I, I find that, you know, being an artist and, and making work for, for galleries can be um, amazing and really um, powerful, but I often thinking about different ways to engage um, outside of the sometimes elitist boxes to show work. Um, and so one of the things that I, um, I've been doing is, you know, I've been working as a programmer and organizer um, and curator, and I've done this for a number of uh, galleries and for a number of uh, big institutions and uh, kind of spit and duct tape institutions. And for the most part, you know, art is the vehicle that kind of brings us all together. And it's something that I'm really focused on. But what I'm most interested in is ways to build community and to build solidarity um, while amplifying different um, or amplifying different artists' voices um, as well as their vision. And so the last project I want to talk about is uh, is a Wikipedia editathon uh, called Art and Community, and it's part of an ongoing series of editathons that I started with Uzma Rizvi, who is an anthropologist and professor at Pratt, um, and we developed this this idea um, of having an editathon as we were co-teaching um, a class about art, culture, and community development. We noticed that there was an alarming absence. Uh, of women of color, trans and queer artists, activists, and community builders on Wikipedia. And so Art and Community was born. For the last five years since then, I've often organized uh, uh, edit thons, you know, maybe one or two a year. Um, and uh, I often have them embedded within an artist residency that I'm in or uh, within a course that I'm teaching. Um, I could have sort of, uh, or we could have sort of made this uh, edit on kind of like uh, packageable and, and given to other people, but there's something about um, working closely with people that I really uh, enjoy and I think is really an important part of the process. Uh, I'm always trying to collaborate with people from um, the specific community that I'm in. So, you know, for example, uh, when I was on a residency at Project for Empty Space, we had um, an editathon where we invited uh, organizers and people from the community uh, to write um, profiles for artists and organizers from Newark, New Jersey. Um, and you know, people came out and, and we, we added a lot uh, of, of, new, of new articles into the, into the listing. And, you know, it, it's also an excuse or it's also a way, you know, when you're working with people over time to encourage the deeper conversations and sustain discussions with the participants. Um, and normally we have uh, long sprawling conversations about online meritocracies, about structural inequities, about bias and radical archiving. And although, you know, it's just like a drop in the bucket, we've added, you know, we've added so many new um, articles for artists, activists, and organizers. Um, and, you know, it, it's really been, it's really been a, a great project that's kind of like had a life of its own. Um, and I remember, you know, just, I guess, a week or two ago, I was talking to uh, a, a previous board member of a New York um, collective that uh, kind of wasn't really meeting or talking and they kind of, uh, went on to do different things, I think, in, uh, in the 90s or early 2000s. And my students and I put up uh, their uh, Wikipedia page, and this became like another catalyst for them um, to start meeting again. So now they're actually meeting again. I saw that they have uh, 
you know, in the Instagram uh, page, looking at different things. And I talked to um, one of the members last week and he said they're, they're trying to do some more programming. So there's a really nice way of, um, that some of these projects like kind of grow on their own and it really uh, it excites me um, when it comes to these kinds of things. So uh, I think that that will end the, the kind of formal-ish uh, part of my, uh, my conversation. And um, I think it's maybe a good time to transfer into uh, the Q&A now. Thank you so much, Jarrett. If you want to stop sharing your screen, you'll see all the panelists who are with you. Um, thank you. That was so interesting. And just all the creative ways that you're interrogating imagery and media and technologies and decolonizing them. Um, does anyone here have a question from among the panelists that would like to speak first? Just raise your hand or turn your mute off. No. Uh, oh, I'm seeing now lots of hands. <laughs> Josh, why don't you start? Oh, thank, thank you so much um, for, for that presentation. And I was just taken by so many different forms of media that you're involved with and, and the kinds of projects that you're making. I'm interested if you could speak a little bit more about your research process. I mean, it seemed to be a form of artistic production in and of itself and, and how you might document it or, or do track it or, um, yeah, just sort of how you account or perhaps even archive um, just your, your research process because it seemed to be so in intricate and, you know, so uh, creative and connected to the work that you make. Thanks. That's a, that's a great question. And I think uh for each project for each work it shifts slightly um and it, it's a very it's a very organic process and i do think about it in terms of um you know a creative process or like a, a i just i kind of um i kind of react to the world around me right there's something that happens there's something that kind of sticks in my teeth there's something that haunts me. There's something that I can't quite um, get a hold of. And I use my work um, as a way to figure it out. And so what I often do is I, I have these questions that kind of form just as I operate and move through the world. And what I do is I just kind of give them space and I kind of um, highlight them. Okay, these are kinds of the things that I'm interested in looking at. Um, and then what it, what it does is it becomes this weird creative net that starts to catch everything around you, right? Like, it's kind of like when you learn a new word, um, you hear it everywhere, right? So when you ask a question, um, you start seeing um, different kinds of answers or different kinds of questions. Um, so for sometimes it takes 10 years of organic, weird, quixotic um, thinking to, to kind of culminate in a work. Um, and sometimes it takes, you know, a very uh, concerted, uh, you know, chunk of time when I'm producing something for a show or for a project. Uh, but really, it's kind of this dance between uh, a structured analytical thing and a um, like a, a very intuitive kind of thing. It's almost like it's going to sound so corny, but it's almost like dancing. There's like a structure to it, but there's also like a letting go um, that happens. Um, and so maybe I didn't answer your question exactly, uh, but in but in 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 each situation, the research process, uh, the creative research process, is is very different. And there's there's something about giving myself the permission to be free to think in the weird ways that I do, that I feel is also part of um, is part of this uh, a part of owning it a little bit. You know, you don't have to make something that has. Um, an object at the end of it. You don't have to research so you can present an essay or um, or a lecture about it. You can just kind of like think with both sides of your brain um, while you're uh, looking at the world. All right, William, question. Yeah, just let me amplify the thanks um, that Josh gave. Thank you. Um, the, the, your opening image or close to opening image of the of the King Emperor. <laughs> Um, and and the 
Yeah, that was a that's a really haunting image, and 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 it sort of resonated throughout your presentation. And I just want to pick up on so what you just explained to us is very much about um, expression, about feelings you have that you're finding you're giving voice to, and yet that picture is a real testament to the communicative power of 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 these utterances. And and I'm, and I guess my question has to do with audience. Um, is that important in your work? Is there a particular kind of audience? How do you navigate that space? Um, do you is is part of your the the, the refining of your work um, done in conversation with audience or some some sense of audience response? Who's your public and 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 how do, does that matter in your work? Yeah, it's it's one of the it's one of the most complicated uh, questions. Uh, it's it's a question that that all artists should think about. You know who. Um, who are you communicating with, right? And, and what are you communicating? And it's it's been a it's it's a lot more um, it's a lot more tricky to speak in a language um, to speak in the language of the art world when you're kind of invisible in these other ways, right? So um, so in order to communicate in ways that uh, uh, talk to the wider public, you can end up. Uh, assimilating or cutting off um, parts of, uh, of the magic that um, kind of come from making work. So the idea of like uh, opacity, um, you know, that uh, people like Brissot sort of offer us, or the idea of the inappropriable that uh, thinkers like Tracy and Ha um, kind of uh, gifted um, to me, uh, become another way of um, owning um, both the individual sort of uh, love of expression while not uh, feeling forced to communicate with a wider audience, right? So, so who does my audience actually become <laughs> is a whole other question, right? Um, and so it seems like uh, if, if you look at, you know, the evidence would be for, um, you know, for my exhibitions, like who shows my work, who comes to the shows. And I think it's a really wide range of people who are interested in, um, in the media, who are interested in art technology, um, some who are interested in philosophy, but often my work gets shown in diasporic spaces. And, um, you know, one of the things that I was told, uh, you know, was that my work um, immediately, when somebody saw my work, they're like, oh, this is diasporic work. Like this is work that is made by somebody um, in the diaspora. And I didn't know exactly what they meant or how they saw it, but it seems like that's something that, um, that comes out. And, and I'm very cognizant of making work um, out of my generation and out of my concerns and out of my circle of, of concern. Um, and so that means that sometimes uh, the wider audience may uh, not quite grasp it or they can grasp like certain elements of it. Um, but I think that I think that part of my job is to be as honest as possible and sort of put that work out there. And then hopefully the audience will form. And you know, hopefully that's the thing that uh, you know good art or interesting art does is it doesn't actually calibrate to the existing questions, but it reformulates the question. And also that you're a curator and an organizer seems other ways that you intervene and sort of bring in participants almost into the, the dialogue that way. Um, are there, uh, let's see, Vivek has a question. Hi, Jarrett. Um, it's such a pleasure to have you here and have your work here in this space. Um, actually, you answered almost everything in your last answer. <laughs> that I wanted to ask, you know, uh, similarly around, um, around audience. Um, there's one aspect to that that I wanted to just, you know, follow up on. And, and that is, you know, thinking about, and I'm speaking as someone, you know, our circles overlap quite a bit. Um, and, um, and I've seen sort of a, a shift within South Asian American, Asian American, um, second gen immigrant art um, practices and audiences, etc., just in the last few years. Um, and part of it has to do with this, you know, shift away from feeling like we need to or, 
you know, need to centrally um, uh, achieve a kind of acceptance or acknowledgement or inclusion, even though those battles are still important, right? That, that um, I, I guess the question is really about um, to follow up on audience um, is to think about how does the aim of your work shift or how does the aim of, you know, our cohorts work shift when the aim um, ceases to be acceptance, acknowledgement, inclusion, when the audience ceases to be a broad audience and becomes focused in on uh, a more, um, <clears throat> an audience that, that sort of in some ways organically forms around the work and its concerns. Um, so what is it that, that you feel like you're, you want your work to do with that, with that audience that's distinct from what the work might try to do if it were geared towards uh, this kind of larger idea of mainstream acceptance or, or whatever. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally makes sense. And I think that, I mean, that's what we're kind of striving towards always, right? Being the, the most um, honest version of, of oneself, like really kind of like getting in, in deep and pulling out um, the work that, that maybe only you can make or maybe you can act as a, um, uh, sort of a conduit to make. Um, so what happens when we do that? I think that's when the actual magic happens. I think that's where the uh, potential like uh, freedom can happen, the liberatory like uh, part of uh, speculative fiction or of you know um, creation is that we can actually celebrate um, in in a larger, deeper way um, with other people. Um, and one of the things that I've always noticed, you know, um, with work that is radically vulnerable, is that um, I often, when I inter interact with it, I feel seen and I feel like, oh, like I hear, um, you know, that that song, like that kind of like references or is a mashup of, of the, um, the the kinds of sounds that I know, I feel like seen and the frequency uh, kind of resonates in another way. And so hopefully what I can do, and I'm not saying that I, uh, I do do this, but if I'm, the idea is if I am radically vulnerable and honest, perhaps it can also spread to other um, other people who are thinking similar things or who are, uh, you know, I could uh, potentially connect with, with different um, realities that, that we have. But also I think for younger artists, it can um, it can it can be a way to um, to kind of own it. Um, you know, kind of, kind of own that we are uh, these mashups that we are, we are both and we're not either or, and we don't have to be aspiring towards, uh, you know, the, the mainstream because the mainstream in many ways um, is, requires a lot of, uh, a lot of violence to, to our realities. And so, you know, kind of to tie it in just quickly as well to the last question, I mean, one of the things I sometimes do is I think about making work for a younger version of myself. <laughs> um, and, and, and that's one, one thing that I, that, I, uh, that I think helps me in, in, in some moments where I'm like, okay, this is like really too crazy. You know, there's like, this is coming in from this side and it's coming from that side. Uh, who's gonna look at this work? Uh, you know, where is it gonna fit? I'm just like, okay, forget it. Just like, you know that these ideas um, are true to you. So, um, you know, thinking about making work for a younger version of myself sometimes gives me the courage to, uh, to speak. Okay, it looks like we have one question from the audience, which I'll read. Um, it says, can you please suggest sources to improve storytelling skills for this type of these types of projects are in general, actually. About these, about storytelling, um, I think, you know, I think that the ways that people tell stories, um, it's, it's, 
It's an interesting thing. Like, I feel like there's different kinds of stories that are told by different kinds of people in different kinds of mediums that have different kinds of languages. And part of telling um, your story or telling stories really for me feels like an extremely personal, uh, a personal thing, right? Like how um, you develop your voice, how you develop your cadence, how you develop uh, the tools and the language that you use. It feels almost like a question that is is like almost like a, a super personal question, like how do you be a good artist or how do you be a good person in the world? And so I'm not trying to, to shy away from the question, but I think that, that within that question um, is almost like a, a call to action. You, you kind of have to do it. You have to kind of um, look at things that inspire you, uh, think about why those stories inspire you, think about how they're telling those stories, and think about ways that you can um, also integrate your own uh, way of, of thinking into um, whatever mode makes sense to you. Great. Any more questions from the panelists? Um, Amber. Hi, Yurit. Thank you so much for your talk. I was wondering, like, because you chose, you show us like many like mediums. Uh, that you use. So I was wondering how do you choose which medium to use in like each single project to deliver your idea? Yeah, I think that um, I think that every every medium is like a language and every uh, let's say that every medium can communicate one set of things but maybe doesn't communicate another set of things as well. Um, and so I think I respond, like, so I'm acting uh, intuitively on one level, but I also, um, you know, I, I kind of like follow my nose a bit, but then uh, at a certain point, I start to uh, analyze and think through, okay, should this be a video? Should this be um, a slide show? Should this be uh, a writing? Should this be a thing? And it's, um, I think that's part of what plays into every um, every work. And so again, kind of like the other uh, question about research, it's really on a case by case basis. And so um, I devise like whole systems of communicating or creating images, like specifically for that that idea, right? So the info, Rorschach graphics were uh, because I was really interested in Rorschach tests. And really interested in like the proliferation of uh, infographics that were representing a kind of like uh, truth or like data, you know. Um, you know, there was just like a proliferation of them in, in like the, I guess the early aughts that they were beside every single um, article, uh, and you know they were being used in, to to communicate like authority, um, or they were also, but they were also artistic, right? Like all data. Um, mapping all data projections are uh, visualizations are artistic, right? They, there's a way that um, that they, they function in the world. So uh, the quick answer is um, it really it really depends. It really depends on on what uh, what what I'm interested in. And I normally start uh, somewhere close to home, and then I kind of experiment with different things, and I live with the different forms, um, and uh, and then. Like I, I print things off, I put them out, you know, around uh, my studio. I would, I'll, I'll do like a short video that would be kind of like a sketch, and then I give it some time. I come back to it and I see what speaks to me, um, you know, and what what stands the test of time. Like what uh, is still interesting uh, a week later, a month later, two months later, and that's normally uh, how I end up uh, keeping something is that it has to still have potential energy and not just be like a one, two, three, where I can just read it and it's, it's done. All right, Jarrett, well, we're about out of time. So thank you so much for your fascinating presentation and taking us through the your thought process, um, which is really intricate and, and deep. So, and thank you to everyone here for joining us today. 
and we will see you next week. Thank you. Bye-bye.